Well, good morning and welcome, generations. I want to start us off with God's word. Isaiah 25, 1. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful, and sure. Would you just bow your heads with me as we open our service in prayer? Father, thank you so much for today, for the beautiful weather outside. We thank you that we can be gathered in your name. We ask that you would just be with us in this time, that we would just be able to worship you, um, that you would just speak to us through what you would have us here. We ask you to just be with us in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand and join us in worship? Good morning, Generations Church family. It is a great day to be gathered together in the house of the Lord. I will ask you at this time to take a, out a copy of our bulletin. Hopefully you were given one or picked one up on your way in. And I want to make a note of a few things happening in the life of the church. You will first off notice our bulletins are laid out a little differently this morning. Uh, there is an extra tab there. It's actually perforated, um, so you can tear it off and... If you're a guest with us, we ask that you tear it up, that you fill out the guest information form and drop it in the offering plate as it comes by this morning. But also, on one side, there is space to, prov to write down some prayer requests that if you need prayer, um, every Wednesday, starting this last Wednesday, we are holding a prayer service from 7 until about 8, or however long we, we need to go to cover everything. And we want to know how to pray specifically for you. So if you have something that you need prayer for, jot it down on that, tear it off the bulletin, and drop it in the offering plate. Um, and if you don't want it to be shared, just mark on there, please do not share, just for pastor's eyes only. Um, and that'll get to me privately that way. I can pray for it, because I am praying for each and every one of you. Um, so just some, some new things happen in there. Um, but uh, making... Uh, no, of uh, other things happening in the life of the church, ladies, there is a ladies event coming up on the 22nd. It's a Thursday evening at 6.30, 
it will be held at Jody Shaw's house. Sorry for the font and uh, not just the style, but the size of it. I know it's a bit hard to read, but it's at 6.30 at Jody Shaw's house. Um, it's going to be a jewelry making event. Um, all, all the materials are, will be provided. All, they, all the, the people who are putting together asking is that you just bring a, a snack or dessert to share with the rest of the ladies. Um, so 6.30, if you need inform more information, see Jody Shaw. Unfortunately, she's not here this morning. Um, you can talk to Stephanie um, right over here, my wife, uh, and she'll get you the details that you need. Also, I know that it's probably been floating around in the ladies' group text that, that is ongoing. Um, so if you have any questions, you can also get a part of that text message, and, and they'll, they'll share it with you. Uh, again, Wednesday night prayer service at 7 p.m., so if you weren't able to join us last week, that's okay. We're having it every week moving forward. So join us at 7 p.m., uh, a wonderful time. We had a wonderful time this last Wednesday, and even yesterday with the men, um, had a wonderful prayer breakfast, and just so thankful for the men of this church and even for their hearts and getting to hear what God has impressed upon them. Our next fall festival planning meeting will be October, Sunday, October 2nd at 1130, just to revisit everything that we've discussed, get some updates about, about uh, some of our, our materials and what we will need to make sure that fall festival goes off without a hitch on the 29th of October. Um, that'll be from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. on that Saturday. It's the last Saturday of October that we'll have that. So weather permitting, we will have it here on this property, and it'll be a great time. A lot of other things happening in the life of the church. One thing happening today after the service is our new member orientation luncheon. If you are interested in becoming a member, this is one thing you want to be at. But, or if you became a member earlier this year so you could vote on me becoming your next pastor, this was something that was put off for a time just so you could take, take part in that vote. But Either way, we want you at this luncheon. Lunch is provided. It is going to be a taco bar, so come and enjoy it. Um, we will have materials for you to look at to know a bit more about who the church is, where we've come from, where we are going, know, get to know me a little bit better as your pastor, and then know what it means to be a member of not just the church universal, but of this church body, of Generations Church. So join us at 11.30 in the south classroom of Modular 1. That's the half of the modular right outside the main door here where the adults meet Sunday mornings for their, their classroom time. A lot of things happening in the life of the church, a lot of exciting things. And before I get to a word of prayer, um, I know some of you have already gotten them. You've been handed them by me or Kevin but we did order some of the scripture journals for our series right now. It's actually, the scripture journal covers First and Second Peter and Jude. If you're interested in getting one of these, we have some up here right now. All you need to do is raise your hand, and I'll have Kevin come and give them to you. So if you're interested in getting one of these to take notes in for the service today, because I know keeping track of a bulletin with your notes on the back gets difficult. So it's all in one place, easy to keep, keep track of, um, great, great resources to have because you can use these again and again even if you've marked them up completely. Um, so we have plenty of them. Um, if you know of anyone who would want one who's not here today, just let us know. We'll, we'll make sure we have some set aside. But so excited to be gathered together this morning. I have a couple of lifelong friends even though I've known them only for about seven years. Wow, seven years. Um, visiting from Texas, these are two individuals near and dear to me who, who walked with me through a dark period in my life when I, I began to doubt God and what he was doing, and yet they were there as the body of Christ to keep me on track, to encourage me, to exhort me. Um, so blessed to have them with us for, for this weekend. Uh, and just and worship with us, but also spending time together with them. Um, so if you've seen two new faces, unfortunately they're only here this weekend, but they'll, they'll be back in, in months and years to come to visit us. But thankful for them and for their friendship and their brother and sisterhood in my life and walk with the Lord. With that, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you to praise your name, to give you thanks and to 
sing your praises of all that you've done in our lives and continue to do. Lord, I thank you for this body of believers called Generations Church and for their love in each other's lives, for their love and encouragement and care for one another. Of what I got to see briefly in just hearing the hearts of some of our men and just the burdens they carry. Lord, I thank you that we can come to you and give those over to you knowing that you will take care of them, that you are working in them. Lord, I thank you for the time that we are able to gather together on Sunday mornings to, to worship and praise you as, as your gathered body. Be with us this morning, Father, as we continue to lift up your praise and your worship through song and then through the reading of your word. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we ask this in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Would you stand and join us in more worship? Kevin Carroll is going to come up and do our offertory prayer. These fine young men here carry all this for us. Good morning, church. It's good to see everybody. Um, we've got a a few of our parishioners are out this morning traveling uh, all around the country, but in the same sense, <clears throat> God has provided us some new visitors this morning. As I look around to the left and the right, we have new visitors to uh, backfill that. So uh, it's good that we got a full house of the Lord here. I pray for traveling graces for our members who are traveling and for you visitors here coming and going today. Okay. All right, dear Lord, thank you for this day, uh, a day of rest, a day of worship, a day of reflection. <clears throat> Please quiet our hearts as we get close to uh, hearing the message that uh, Brett has prepared. Help us to be attentive, Lord, and pay attention and, uh, and to uh, help us to comprehend and apply what the message is going to be today. We ask that you bless this offering, Lord, uh, make it fruitful for the church, and help us to be good stewards of it. In your name, Father, amen.
seated. He was first named Simon, but Jesus named him Peter. He was a simple fisherman off the west coast of the Sea of Galilee in northern Israel. He was strong, independent, and had a direct, impetuous way about himself. He was married and lived a fairly normal life until Jesus said, follow me. Peter would become one of the 12 disciples. He was among Jesus' closest friends and boldly proclaimed his lordship. He was also first to cut and run and was first to deny Christ when he was crucified. He was the first that Christ appeared to after he had risen from the dead and Peter would be the first to raise his voice and preach on the day of Pentecost. He wrote his first letter to the churches in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia around AD 63. His letter is intended for Christians who journey through this world as aliens and strangers to find their hope in Christ alone. All of these are found in 1 Peter. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. No longer a slave to fear. We no longer are entrapped, ensnared, victim, prey, or in bondage to fear. We are no longer slaves to sin or its power, for we have been bought with a price. We have been ransomed and born again. Ransomed and born again, not just to any random thing or being, but ransomed and born again to and in God. In God, we have been adopted, we have been chosen, and thus are precious in his eyes. We stand now as his adopted children, confident and steadfast in his grace, mercy, and love, which was lavished on us by the precious blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. So we stand with the aid of the Spirit of God and live for God's glory, honor, and praise. We are no longer slaves to fear. We are children of God. What words to reflect upon this morning as we enter into a time of the reading of the Word of God. If you are a guest with us in person or online, again, welcome. We are glad to have you here this morning. We are in the midst of a series through the book of 1 Peter, a letter written by the Apostle Peter, one of the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ, who wrote to the early church. It is not, a, a, not written to any one church in particular, but to the general church. Thus, it is classified as one of the general epistles. This morning we will be focused on the passage of 1 Peter chapter 2, 6 through 12. I will ask you to take out your copy of God's Word and turn with me to our passage this morning. If you're using one of the Bibles from the seat back in front of you, you will find our passage on page 1117. Again, that is page 1117. I will give you a moment to turn there. I stumbled across this story this, this past week. A group of friends and family decided to hike the Sashone Geyser Basin in Yellowstone. They even tried to come prepared for the unexpected. But what they didn't prepare for were fines, probation, and a temporary ban on the park. Three of the individuals in the party pled guilty to the minor offense of foot travel in a thermal area after being discovered by park rangers trying to cook their food in one of the park's hot springs. A park res representative said a ranger responded and found two whole chickens in a burlap sack in a hot spring. The ranger found the group and questioned them about their behavior before issuing citations. According to the park representative, 
The laws in place that prohibit access beyond de designated trails are there to protect not only the park itself, but the public as well. For it's recorded that hot spring waters can exceed 400 degrees Fahrenheit with the potential to cause severe or fatal burns. Such was the case earlier when a three-year-old girl suffered second-degree burns after falling into, into a hydrothermal area. The same thing happened in 2016 to a 23-year-old, but he wasn't so lucky. He succumbed to his burns. One of the group members says that he and his friends did their best to be careful double packing the chickens inside in a roasting bag and a burlap sack so as to avoid contaminating the waters. The individual went on to say, the way I interpreted it was, don't be destructive. And I didn't feel like I was. A num another member of the group said he saw some of the signage indicating they were in a closed area, but didn't think the signs applied to the hot springs themselves. He agreed that the group wasn't doing any damage, but added, I can see that we should not have done that. Moral of this story, don't try to boil a chicken in the hot springs of Yellowstone. The group of individuals willfully chose to disregard and disobey clearly marked signage, rules, and regulations. And as a result of doing this, they were punished. This morning, as we unpack our passage of 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 through 12, we will see that even the Word of God, which is clearly marked, which is clear, clear signage, which gives us clear regulations, it too is a stumbling block and a rock of offense to some. Why? Because they blatantly disregard the Word of God and don't disobey God. However, for those who have been born again, those to whom Peter has written this letter, to the early believers and to us, the Word of God is our cornerstone. Christ is our foundation, Christ is our living hope, and in Him we have been given life everlasting. By this, we are then members of a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. All so we can proclaim the excellencies of God who has called us out of the darkness. But why hear this from me? Let us turn to the source and hear the word of God from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 through 12. Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes, beginning in verse 6, For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the, among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your mercy and your grace and your love in our lives that was so lavishly poured out for us through your Son, Jesus Christ, and the gift that we have in the Holy Spirit and the aid that he is to us to keep us according to your will and your commandments. Be with us this morning, Father, as we seek to further unpack this passage and diligently apply your truths to our lives, that we would live according to your will. 
Be with us in this time, Father. We ask this in your Son's precious and holy name. Amen. This week, Peter continues where we left off last week by turning our focus to the foundation of our faith, the cornerstone upon which all of Christianity is built, Jesus Christ. In verse 6, Peter quotes the prophet Isaiah, who has already spoken much by the Spirit of the Lord of the promised Messiah. And it is here that Isaiah yet again points the, the nation of Israel to seek God and rely on him and his ways. Isaiah points very clearly to the promised Messiah, the Redeemer of all who trust and believe in the Lord. It is Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16, which Peter is quoting in our passage this morning, and so fits into the overall message of Peter's letter as he is pointing us to trust in, rely upon, and hope in Jesus Christ. It is really no surprise that Peter uses the analogy of building stones when recalling the fact that Jesus named him Cephas, which when translated means rock. It was at this that Christ then stated, according to Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, And I tell you, because he's speaking to Peter, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now before we go further, I want to make clear that there is much debate as to whom Christ was referring to when he said, on this rock. However, if we weigh that against the rest of Scripture, we see it to be clear that while Peter was used to assist in the establishment of the church, the church was indeed, though, built upon the foundation of the rock, the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ. It is this point that Peter is further emphasizing in verse 6 to make it clear that just as we are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood because we are living stones, it is all according to the foundation upon which we stand, Jesus Christ. It was this cornerstone that was selected by God, chosen and precious, and for whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. When we are firmly established in Christ, when we stand in and upon him, nothing can shake us. Nothing can move us. There's nothing that can separate us from God so long as we stand firmly in God through Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul makes this plain to us in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 through 39, where he writes to the believers in Rome, For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus Christ is our hope and foundation. When we rely entirely upon Jesus Christ, we will not be shaken. We will not be put to shame. It is to this point that Peter then shares in verse 7 that it is, an, it is an honor for those of us who believe and have faith in Jesus Christ. However, there is the adverse to this. For those who do not believe in Jesus Christ and is not their cornerstone upon which they build the entirety of their life, he has been rejected. Peter continues this into verse 8 by then sharing that for those who have rejected Jesus Christ, he has become a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Christ is both of these things because of what Peter shares in the next portion of verse 8. Because they disobey the word of God, they ignore it and do not seek to honor or acknowledge God. Peter shares that they were destined to do so, for it is no surprise to God that some would and definitely do reject him. So God has given them over to their sinful natures, and their hearts have been hardened. It's Paul again who shares something similar to this in his first letter to the Corinthians. Looking briefly at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 22-24, Paul writes, For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, 
Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Those who reject God can never fully wrap wrap their minds around Christ crucified and therefore find it to be folly and so stumble. Yet Peter's point, too, just as Paul indicates, is that Christ crucified, Christ as the chief cornerstone, becomes a stumbling block and offensive because all who come face to face with him stand face to face with their shortcomings, with their own sin. For some, this moment is too much, and rather than step into God's light, they shrink back into the darkness and stay there because they can keep hidden their depravity, their shame. Yet for those who step in God's light, it is not meant to merely merely reveal their shame, their sin, but to reveal the change that has taken place by the sovereignty and providence of God. This we see in John chapter 3, verses 19 through 21. We all know John 3, 16, but how many of us go beyond that and see what Christ says to Nicodemus in this passage? And so we, record, we, are, we have recorded Christ's words as this. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. For those who step into God's marvelous light, they are then described as several things from what we see in verse 9 of our passage this morning in 1 Peter. Those who step into God's light are then called a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. God has chosen the church of Jesus Christ, has chosen us to be his instrument for his own purposes. God has made the church a royal priesthood because we now stand as witnesses to his great mercy and grace and therefore are called to share it with those around us. God has made us a holy nation set apart and distinct from all other people so that we would become beacons of his light in this dark world. God has made us a people for his own possession so that, and this is what we find in the last portion of verse 9, so that we would proclaim his excellencies. For God has called us out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. Again, it was not to merely shed the light on shed light onto our sin, but to show that our sin has been covered by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the sacrificial Lamb of God. Christ was sent to be crucified in a sinner's place, was buried in a borrowed tomb, and rose on the third day, conquering sin and death, all by the will of the Father. So when we step into God's marvelous light, it is so that we become evidence of his mercy and grace, that his power is revealed to all, and it is clear that he alone is our salvation. Peter Peter furthers this line of thinking in verse 10 by then sharing that those of us now in the church were once not a people and had not yet received mercy. Yet God, in his infinite wisdom, made us his people and showed us his mercy, again through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We were once without hope, lost and destined to an eternal death. Yet God chose us through adoption according to faith in Jesus Christ, his Son. Therefore, we stand firmly upon a firm foundation, Jesus Christ, and are being built up to be used by God for his own purposes. It is then, at this point in our passage, that Peter shifts focus ever so slightly to now exhorting us, once again calling us sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. In verse 11, Peter reminds us not just of his, his affection for his fellow believers, but also of God's by calling us beloved, those cherished, those deemed precious, once again revealing to us that we are deeply cared for by other believers but most importantly, by God. 
from this point, Peter then uses the same ter terminology from his opening and calls us to once again, as a holy people, to abstain from the passions of the flesh, for they wage war against our soul. They do so because these passions lead us away from God. They lead us away from the true fellowship with other believers and leave us lost and without hope. Even James wrote of this, which we saw as we worked our way through his letter earlier this year. And I remind you of it again. From James chapter 1, 13 through 15, he writes, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured enticed and enticed by his own desires. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. It is, it is the desires of our sinful heart that lead us astray and drive us into sin, which only separates us from God and leaves us hopeless and confused. Yet when we abstain from these very desires and passions— when we crucify them, when we replace those desires and passions with those of God through Jesus Christ by aid of the Holy Spirit, we stand in victory. Again, I do not want to make light of how Peter refers to his fellow believers, including us, by reminding us of our sojourning, of our exile. Not because we are just passing through this land or in, indeed exiles, but because we identify through Christ Jesus. We find our identity in Christ Jesus. It is because of our relationship with God through Jesus Christ, with aid of the Holy Spirit, we are called to therefore live differently than the rest of the world. And as such, we are often seen as the outsiders, as the fanatics, as the crazies. We do not do the things that the world deems acceptable or permissible. And it was Paul, yet again, who made this clear to believers when he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and chapter 10 that in both of these portions of his first letter to the Corinthian church, Paul tells them that while all things may be lawful, not all things are helpful. Not all things build up or edify. Therefore, we are called to not seek our own good, but the good of others. How we live our lives, whether we realize it or not, impacts those around us. This does not mean we ought to always be walking on eggshells around one another. Rather, we consider how our actions will be perceived, will be interpreted, and will be received by those around us, both in and outside of the church. Paul's point in both of these passages, especially in the latter of 1 Corinthians 10, verses 22 through 33, is to do all to the glory of God, to live holy and blameless lives before the Lord, even if it means being looked at as a fanatic or the oddball by the rest of the world. So we are called to not only abstain, as Peter is urging his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ to do, but to also do away with the former passions that once filled us. They have no place in our hearts, in our lives, especially as we weigh them in and against being called and made into what we see in verse 9 of our passage this morning. And just as we saw last week when Peter called out five fleshly and sinful attitudes and actions, we see even more so this week how those have no place in our lives and why Peter is again saying, abstain from these things. Can you feel his urging? Can you feel his care for his brothers and sisters? For us? I certainly do. Peter does not leave us with his exhortation to abstain from the passions of the flesh without further charge on how we ought to live then. It is in our last verse of our, our passage this morning, verse 12, that Peter continues his exhortation in charge of his fellow believers, of us. Peter's further encouragement here is to, to his fellow believers, the ones to whom this letter was originally written, was because they were facing accusation from outsiders. They were being slandered and maligned by unbelievers. So Peter's encouragement is to keep their conduct honorable above reproach. 
meaning that we refrain from doing things that could even possibly be misconstrued to be evil deeds. This again further emphasizes the believer's necessity to rely upon God through aid of the Holy Spirit to keep all that they say and do in accord with the will of God. This, of course, even applies to us today. The more we look at the world around us, the more we see how far gone it is. And even how those outside of the church seek to destroy the church and ultimately reject God. Peter's words in this portion of our text this morning echo very well the words of Paul in Philippians 2, verses 12 through 16, where Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved... As you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud, and that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. In Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, we see his encouragement to them, and subsequently to us, to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. This does not mean that we are able to obtain our own salvation by anything we do, but rather we seek to rely upon God more and more with each passing day so that as to ever be conformed to his image. All so that we might live in such a manner, holy and blameless, without blemish, that glorifies God with the rest of the world looking at us. For we shine as lights in the world, illuminating the way for those who seek out God's will and give a testimony to God's great love for those who believe in him through Jesus Christ. Likewise, Peter is sharing the same thing throughout all of our passages this morning by first restating the foundation upon which we are, we are built. The second, how we are called special names by God. And third, are therefore called to live, live differently. Peter furthers this encouragement by sharing that by keeping our conduct, how we live, act, and treat others as honorable among the rest of the world, they will be without excuse when they themselves stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. They will be unable to further their slander, their maligning, and calling believers evildoers, for they will see that it was the believers who sought to glorify God in all that they have said and done. It is on that very day, the day of judgment, they will see everything done and, and see it was all done for and to the glory of God and will only be left with one response, to glorify God. Now, this does not mean that these individuals will be saved on that day, for they have squandered every opportunity given to them to turn from their evil ways and to turn to God. But what we see is exactly what Paul shared in shared to the Philippians in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11, specifically verses 9 through 11 of that passage, Paul shared this truth. Therefore God has highly exalted him, who is Jesus Christ, and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All will see at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ that God is King of kings, Lord of lords, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. There will no longer be any, any doubt about God's existence. Some will forever sing his praises of holy, 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 while others will experience the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Peter's encouragement to believers in this portion of his letter is to living evermore according to the will of God, to continually be molded into the image of God and to mold your own will and desires after God's. In doing so, we are then called to live in such a manner that even while slandered or called evildoers, we honor and glorify God. 
Peter's exhortation and encouragement is quite clear then. Live holy and blameless lives, especially as we reflect on the reality we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. We do not live as the world does. We do not give ourselves over to the passions of this flesh, though enticing. Rather, we cling to God through Jesus Christ by aid of the Holy Spirit. But how do we practically do that? How do we live out Peter's exhortation and encouragement? One way is to be in regular and constant community with fellow believers. If we know we struggle with anything that distract us, distracts us from God, we need to seek out community with fellow believers who will hold us accountable. To seek out someone who is older and mature in, in faith to, to walk with us. To be the one that will call us up when they have not seen us in a while to check in on us. For me, I have two of those individuals here today who walked with me, excuse me, through a dark period of my life. And honestly, I would not be here today, let alone be married to Stephanie, if it weren't for their love of Jesus Christ to make sure that I pressed on. It's individuals like that that you need in your life who will hold you accountability, but, but who will encourage you, who will exhort you, and who will share the love of God with you, regardless of the pain that you are facing because of your own decisions. They'll tell you you're wrong and that you messed up, but they do it with love. Find individuals like that. But it also means that we abstain from activities that this world says are acceptable, that are, are permissible. They may be acceptable and permissible, but are they beneficial? Do they build up one another? While Scripture does not say you cannot drink, it says do not be filled with wine. Do not be a drunkard. And yet our world is so full of that that people become addicted to it. And I know we have individuals here who are recovering from that, and I am so thankful that they have realized that is not good for them, that it changes who they are. But there are also individuals who will willfully take part in it with those individuals present. Does that not just discourage them? I believe it does. So ask yourself, why do it? It's not meaning you can't drink, drink in private. But why do it in public? It's things like that that the world says are okay, but we see the effects. We further live this out by then joining and belonging to a community of local believers who are united in the same spirit, of one mind and of the same love by becoming an active member of a local church. This can only be done through having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Let me again restate that. can only be done by having a relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The one who has saved you from your sins and now directs you as Lord of your life on how you ought to live. So it too is a call to believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. To confess your sin to God and to yourself because you have deceived yourself saying you do not have sin. And you have lied to God about being without sin. So it's called to confess your sin to God and yourself and to confess that Jesus is Lord and Savior and believing that God is faithful to forgive because of the sacrifice he has made on our behalf. For we have been called out of darkness and into his marvelous light.
We are no longer slaves to fear. We are children of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this glorious morning that you've given to us. For your mercy and your grace in our life, which was lavished and poured out on us through your Son, Jesus Christ. And then the aid that you've given to us in your Holy Spirit to be with us. To hold us accountable to your will and to your word that we would live for your glory and your praise. Lord, for those here this morning who do not know you, I ask that they would just feel your love in their lives, that they would be drawn to you, and that they would confess that Jesus is Lord and Savior, and they desperately need him. Lord, I pray for the ones who are struggling this morning, that you would encourage them, that you would send someone to walk alongside them, to love on them, to urge them ever more towards you, even while it seems hopeless, knowing that you are our hope. Lord, we need you. I need you ever more. Lord, I thank you for this body of believers called Generations Church and for the love that they share with one another and with those outside of the church, that they would ever be the city on a hill that cannot be hidden, whose light shines in the darkness because it is your light. Lord, we love you and we praise you, and we ask this in your Son's precious and holy name. Amen. Would you stand and join us in a closing song? One final reminder, if you're interested in becoming a member of Generations Church, we are having a special new members orientation luncheon. It's in the south classroom of Mod 1. Join us. Lunch is provided. There's plenty. Um, we'd love to see you there, and that gives you an opportunity to get to know the church, get to know me, ask questions about the church and myself if I don't answer them. Um, but I look forward to seeing you there. Uh, join us this afternoon if, if you're interested in doing that. 
Our benediction comes from Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who can stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for you, Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope you are dismissed. for the best of us.